Hi everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, John Walker. I'm the Head of Architecture at Cyrus HQ. Um, so we're a, an AWS consulting partner, essentially. So we build things on the cloud for customers that want to use AWS. So from everything from migrating entire estates to AWS, building new architecture, managed services, and everything in between, really. So um, what I wanted to talk to you today about is just strategies for keeping on top of cloud spend. So I'm, I'm primarily AWS. So some of the examples will be from AWS, but I have tried to kind of make it a bit more general. So some of the things will cover Azure and GCP. It'll be very similar strategies you can use. So things like reserved instances and how to monitor your costs. Each of the cloud providers will have something similar. So um, just a quick bit about myself. Um, so, I just really need to update this because it's not got my right title on there. Um, I'm the head of architecture at Service HQ. Um, also, I'm a AWS ambassador. So I basically go out and talk about AWS, evangelize for it, and help people understand AWS. Um, and basically, a bit more about myself. I've got six AWS certifications out of the 12 that there is, and just a few links to where I'm. I'm also an AWS community builder, which is a program that anyone can join, really, for learning about AWS and basically getting more information from AWS and they do things like credits. They basically bring new people in once a year and as long as you're talking about AWS then you can kind of join that as well. So just a quick overview then of what we're going to do. So there's a few things I want to just cover. So just some tips and strategies about getting the most out of cloud and common cost drivers and challenges. Then ways that you can use cloud native solutions or other ways of using things like rather than just having a virtual machine on the cloud, using things like serverless containers, etc. And monitoring is the last one and about unexpected cost spikes. So just to, to go into a bit more detail about what I mean by sort of cloud cost really, I know it's kind of a broad subject, but the sort of three main areas I wanted to kind of talk about really are the pay-as-you-go model of cloud. So with cloud, the difference between cloud and on-premise really is that you're only paying for what you use in cloud. And that can be a really good thing, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword as well because if you don't know what you're using, you don't know what your costs are. So it can really run away quite quickly. Um, and in cloud, there are both managed and unmanaged services. So generally, there's as, a, as an AWS partner, we do managed services as well, but that's us looking after a system in Amazon. What I mean by a uh, cloud provider here is where AWS or Azure or GCP are managing something for you. So the equivalent of like RDS on AWS, so they'll host a, a MySQL or Postgres or whatever database for you, but they'll handle the underlying infrastructure. You don't need to worry about patching of that. Um, you just need to worry about the actual database itself rather than running it and installing all the software yourself. And just one point I wanted to talk about in cloud is that although you, it's a pay-as-you-go model, costs in cloud are complicated um, because you're paying for every element of what you use. So on a virtual machine, for instance, rather than just paying one cost, you may be paying a cost for the instance, cost for the storage, a cost for the backups, cost for the data transfer. And that can be hard to actually understand. And there are some tools that you can use to kind of break that down. But a lot of the understanding really comes from looking at the bill and what you're getting charged for, essentially. Um, and just, uh, just some quick examples here of, <coughs> this is an AWS specific example, but this is from the AWS cost calculator, which can give, give you a good breakdown. And you can see, I've, I've put this here just to kind of show you how complicated some of it can get. Even just, this is just a simple EC2 instance, and you've got multiple different options of how you want to pay for it, whether you want to pay up front, whether you're going to be using it on demand or scaling it up and down, uh, even spot instances, which I'll come on to later. But even just the basic one here, you've got the instance cost, data transfer cost, some metrics, block store, and then you add backup, et cetera, into that. So, each one of these items are built separately within your, your build that you get from, from Amazon. So 
really knowing what those line items are helps you understand what your full costs are. Because it's, it's key to actually get the full picture of what you're, you're paying for because you may have, for example, you have an instance that's got 100 gig of block storage. If you need to add an extra 200 gig, then you need to kind of understand how much that's going to impact you. And that might be different from another instance that you've got that's the same size, same memory, same everything, but the block storage is different. Um, so really understanding how those costs break down is really key to actually understanding your cloud costs, but there is a lot of information there. Um, even dams and pricing pages can be quite complicated to work out, but something like the cost calculator actually gives you a really good breakdown where you put in as much information as you can and it will give you these summaries of how it's actually broken down. Um, and just a, another example here, this is from, I think this is actually from Azure. Um, so same idea, you can use a cost overview just to figure out like what you're going to do, how much it's going to, how much you're actually going to get, so 50 gig in this case, how much it's going to cost per hour. Um, and there's some other tools out there as well, so there's like one called, uh, it used to be called ec2instances.info, but I think it's an advantage.sh. Um, that's really useful for figuring out EC2 and RDS costs because you can really drill down to the instance type, how you're going to pay for it, and it'll give you all the details of the differences between the different uh, instance types because I think Amazon now have, I don't know, about 100 different instance types for all different use cases. So really that allows you to kind of drill down what you're going to use it for. So just a bit more about the sort of pay-as-you-go model. I've focused here just on virtual machines just as to give you an example, but the difference between like on-premise is you're paying for, essentially, you, most of the time you'll be paying for a contract or you'll be paying a fixed amount, but <clears throat> over time, you will not actually be using it all, all the time. So your, your costs are just gonna keep piling up because you're just paying for it over and over again. But with like AWS or other cloud providers, you're only paying for what you're actually using. So if you don't need the instance, you can turn it off or you can, you can size it in a different way um, or use things like auto-scaling. So if you've got peak traffic where, say you've got a website that people visit during the day and that's the time you need your servers up and running, you can have more servers at that time and then less servers during the night and just have it automatically scale up and down based on the traffic. And then you're only paying for what you actually need. But within the pay as model, as I mentioned, you need to kind of think about all the different aspects of it. So the instance size, storage, back as I mentioned, even things like licensing and support as well, um, especially for things like Windows machines or SQL Server, the license cost can actually really sort of bite you when, you when it comes to cloud costs. Um, one thing I'll just mention on that actually on SQL Server, now I'm talking about it, um, Amazon do have a service called uh, Babelfish, which is it's a way of using Postgres as the back end, but it basically mimics the SQL Server on the front end. So if you've got an application that runs on SQL Server, you can hook it up to essential Postgres database and all the commands that, is, that are sent to it are exactly the same. You don't need to touch your application, but you're not paying the SQL Server cost at the end. You're not paying that licensing cost. Um, and then you can gradually move over to using a mix of Postgres and SQL standard. Um, and eventually you can move all to Postgres if you want, or you can keep the SQL and it will just run exactly as if it was an SQL server, but you're saving the massive licensing cost for that. So it's a really, really good service. It's a uh, Babelfish. Yeah. Um, so it's, a, it's been out about a year or two now, uh, but it's, it's one that I've not really kind of pushed really well, but it's really useful for a uh, special SQL server cost bringing the licensing down. So just notice some sort of strategies about how you can understand your cloud costs. Um, <clears throat> one of the biggest things with understanding uh, and controlling your cloud costs is really knowing what you're using. Because it's really easy in cloud to spin things up and have things up and running in, in minutes or seconds even. But sometimes people forget to turn things off. Um, so actually looking at all of your, your reporting, the different tooling that you've got within each of the different cloud providers to actually understand what you've got running in the cloud is really useful. Um, 
And ways that you can help that is actually with a sort of cost allocation or tagging strategy where you can, with every workload that you've got in the cloud, if you tag it in a certain way to say, right, this is my front end website, and then you tag your, your virtual machines, your database, your storage, and you tag everything related to that under one set of tags, then when you run the reporting, you can see a total cost for that area and add in multiple levels of tags. So you can say, like, okay, this is the workload, this is the department it's in, this is the project it's for. Really allows you to kind of drill down and separate the cost into different strategies. So it allows you to allocate costs to different departments, but also just understand where everything is. And then once you've kind of done that of everything you know, you're probably going to be left over with a bit that's not tagged and you go, okay, what is that? Who's using that? And then you can try and figure that out. Um, so as I mean, just one of the sort of general ways we do it is we do it per project, team and service. So um, that way you've got different ways of looking at the same data and really kind of split it out and understand where it is. But one of the other strategies that you can use um, to go a bit further on this is actually splitting it out by account. So each department can have their own account or you can have a separate account for a particular workload. So if you've got your front end website, you might have a development account for that and a production account for that. And then that way, you know everything in that account, the costs are for that website. There's nothing else in that account. You might have a playground account somewhere else or you might have multiple different workloads. Um, but having them separated out by account really allows you to just say, that's my cost for this particular thing. And there's with like Amazon especially, there's, there's no cost for having multiple different accounts. If you set it up in an organizational structure, we have one master pair account and then sub accounts below that, then you just get one bill and it's just separated out line by line on per account basis. Uh, and there's no, no drawbacks for that really. It's just, it's a bit more overhead to manage, but there's things you can use like single sign on to switch between accounts. Um, but in terms of like a cost, uh, method, there's no real impact on doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is just an example of, this is the Azure cost management portal, so you can really see like, how things are broken down by like, service type and by area. But you, you've got this uh, example here of the different accounts. So you, you may have like four different areas where you've got like particular teams have got their own account but you can further break that down into particular workloads. Um, typically, one, one thing we do is when we do like a, a landing zone infrastructure, that allows you to have like centralized account, have all your logging going to one place, all your security services in another place, and then have workloads per account in that, and everything's linked to the one structure um, So for access, but really for cost as well is kind of one of the main benefits of that. So, just quickly, I wanted to talk about just the, the FinOps Foundation. So these are some overarching principles of how to deal with cost in the cloud, really. Some of them are more applicable to larger organizations. Some of them are applicable across the board. I mean, for the first example there where teams need to collaborate, um, you might only have one team. So uh, that doesn't really apply. But when, when we're talking about collaboration, Having teams know what each other's doing avoids duplication. So if you've got, um, if you do have a, like a centralized account structure, you may have like a networking account that everything goes through. So you have like ingress and egress all via the one account and then it's routed out to different places. If you've got that sort of structure, then each of the teams don't need to set up their own. They just need to uh, hook into that by, like in Amazon's case, you can do a, transit gateway, they call it, and do an attachment to that. But knowing that that's there means that you can actually use it. So if teams aren't talking to each other, one team may have come up with a brilliant solution that is really cost effective, but nobody else knows about it. So you're wasting money essentially anywhere else. Um, and just the, the other ones, they're kind of same, same idea. So the using um, decisions to based on the business value of the cloud, it's really about looking at what cloud offers rather than just going, okay, we have a virtual machine here, so let's just put it in the cloud and you're just lifting it from one place to another. 
um, actually looking at well, what else can cloud offer? Is there another way we can do this that might be more secure, more scalable, cheaper? Um, like sometimes when people first go into the cloud, they might just spin up a virtual machine, but they don't think about the scalability of it. They don't look at auto scaling groups or even things like spot instances for like ephemeral use. Um, this one just on everyone taking ownership. This is, again, this kind of goes back to teams, but this is just about anyone that's using the cloud and has responsibility for deploying something on it should really be able to actually take ownership of, right, this is what we've got, and if it needs decommissioned, they should decommission it rather than waiting for someone else to come along and clean it up. Um, and it would, because it would probably just sit there for ages. The, this, this one, the FinOps data, the, with the way the accounts are structured and the way the billing usually works, a lot of that data is kind of locked down uh, because it's usually accessible to the person paying the bill or the, the department paying the bill. Um, actually democratizing that data to let people know, right, this is exactly what you're using and here's how much it's costing, then they get a real insight into, okay, well, we've got all these VMs and if we actually get rid of some of the stuff we don't need, that gives us a bit more budget we can use elsewhere. We can, we can put it into some other part of our architecture and it might actually be more useful there. Um, <clears throat> so really actually democratizing that data is, is key. There's one or two I kind of wanted to mention here. Um, if, you, if you're using Terraform to deploy to the cloud, um, there's a tool called InfraCost, um, which hooks into your deployment pipeline. And whenever you go to um, deploy and you do a, a uh, prepare, it will give you what the cost changes are going to be as well as the infrastructure changes. So if you up that instance size, it will tell you, right, this is going to cost X amount more per month uh, before you actually even deploy anything. So it's, it's really useful if you're a, a Terraform user. Um, and just the last one here, which will come on to later on with variable cost model of the cloud. So that's things like reserved instances, etc., which I'll, I'll cover in a few slides. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, uh, it's fine if you want yeah, no, I can take some quick questions. Oh, sorry. So, um, um, Paul Scott from uh, Edinburgh Napier University. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of you're talking about everybody taking ownership for the cloud usage, yeah, um, and having a centralized team driving FinOps, and I guess that. A lot of the time, we're trying to give the ownership of the function to the business and the data owner. There, would you see that as being a data, uh, as a business function, or is it a, a secure, uh, an IT function? I'd say, in terms of the actual usage, it's probably more of a business function because if you've got a department that you have things deployed in the cloud, you want them to be able to actually spin up more or, or take them away and actually be responsible for what they're using. Um, it kind of depends. There's some aspects of it, like security aspects that might be centralized in IT, like um, setting up users, et cetera. But I generally think if, a, if a, a particular department or business unit is using the cloud for their, their own workload, they should be able to control what they're doing within that workload, whether that's uh, getting rid of things or... Yeah, and uh, yeah, and ha having them be responsible for the cost as well, because so if you're not responsible for the cost, it's really easy to just go, oh, we'll just add five servers to that, and then somebody else can deal with paying the bill. So, <laughs> um, so just on this, a bit small, this one. Um, <clears throat> so this one is just about having regular reviews, because cloud changes fast, but your usage of cloud also changes fast. So. If you're scaling up or down, you might not realize how, what that's actually doing to your cost. But some, sometimes cloud providers will change things. They may increase their prices, decrease their prices. There might be a, a new way of doing things that's actually going to be cheaper. So actually having a look at, right, what are you actually being charged for? Do we know what everything we're being charged for is actually for? Again, this comes back to the sort of tagging strategy. Um, are there other ways that we can do things? So like. What you may have, you may have a workload in the cloud that you're not currently using as a managed service. So, say like a SQL Server deployed on a virtual machine, but your team spends all their time actually intervening and fixing that and patching it and looking at that, uh, the cost of the manual intervention, and actually saying, right, okay, we're spending hundreds of hours every month to actually fix this thing. 
are we actually better just going to a managed service and have someone else deal with that part of it? Um, and looking at that as an overall. And then can there be other things you can do with payment models? So with reserved instances, um, which I think I've got a slide later on, but I'll, I'll talk about it here as well. Um, on, on AWS especially, where if you know what your workload's gonna be and you're gonna be committed to using that for the next year or, or three years, you can actually buy a reserved credit essentially for that instance type. So say you have a, a your front of the website and you've got three servers running on it, but they only run some of the time. What happens with, if you buy a reserved instance for that type of server, for the time that the, those servers are running, it'll take partial credit off the reserved instance credit you've got. So for example, if you see if two servers and they run half of the day, um, that'll add up to one credit for that day, and then you can spread that over the month and you'll just, it'll take it off the reserved instance cost. But you're basically saving 70% sort of, of the cost if you buy that, but you do need to be able to commit to a year or three years. Uh, and the longer you commit and the more you pay up front, the, the bigger the discounts will be. Um, but generally what I'd recommend is once, you're, once you know that that workload's there and it's going to be there all the time and you're not going to be changing things, then you'd start buying reserved instances. Or uh, there's also savings plans as well that will really kind of, basically the more commitment you give to the cloud provider of how you're going to use it, the more discount they'll give you on it. Um, and just talking about the using the right tool for the job. So with most services, there are different ways that you can convert applications from running on a virtual machine to different services. So you might go down like, the serverless route um, where you have f uh, functions basically that run as code and what will happen is you get a request in, you run the function, it provides an output and then that's it. You don't deal with the servers, you're only paying for that time that you've actually got it. Um, then there's the sort of container model where you're deploying a Docker container, doing Kubernetes. Um, a lot of things that you can, you can package up as a container and then just run it the same locally as you would in the cloud. Gives you more sort of testing ability there. Um, and then just the sort of managed services as well I've already talked about. But also just wanted to kind of mention APIs and sort of microservices. This is more of a architectural change. So to be honest, that could be a whole talk in itself, just that part. Um, but having your application split up into different services allows you to scale the different parts of it separately. So you may have like a back office function that um, only needs to run overnight. Um, but if you've got that all in one monolith running on a virtual machine, then it's always running. Um, but if you split it out into microservices, then you can have that only run when you actually need it and have the rest of your uh, application up and running while well, you actually need it as well. So um, it's really just about considering what you're using and is there a, a different way that you can do it. There's sometimes when you're, if you're converting basically from one area to another, there's going to be some upfront time that you need to invest in it. And there may be some time where you're actually running both side by side. So your cost might actually initially go up, but longer term they should then go down once you get rid of the existing architecture. And yeah, this is the but it's other savings plans and uh, reserved instances. So there's three different types of things I wanted to talk about here. So reserved instances I've already kind of talked about where you're committing to a longer term. So it might be one year, three years. You might pay the entire thing up front and then you've got no monthly cost for the instance itself. You're just paying for the like, backup and storage. Um, you can do a partial up front and it brings it down or you can do no up front, but you're still committing and the more you pay up front, the more of a discount you'll get on each one. And with savings plans, they're similar to reserved instances, but they cover a sort of broader range. So it might cover more instance types, it might cover different types of usage. So you can cover things like uh, ECS, etc. It's maybe a slightly lower discount, but it gives you more flexibility in what you're actually covering. And for spot instances, um, 
what a spot instance is, is where Amazon have unused capacity. So they have millions of virtual machines, but not all of them are being used. So what they do with that unused capacity is they sell it at a discounted rate, but they need the capability to be able to take it back when their demand rises. So what happens is you can get a spot instance and it will perform exactly the same as any other virtual machine, but if Amazon need that machine back, you get a two minute warning. And basically after that two minutes, it'll get shut down. Um, so it's not great for some things, but generally, spot instances have actually come along uh, quite a long way where you can actually have, as long as you've got a control process within your application that within that two minutes you can, you can save the state or if it's stateless, it's even better. Um, as long as you can control what happens with your application, ha you can have lots of spot instances up, up and running and the majority of the time it won't go down. It'll just keep running. You may, it may actually get refreshed, so you may get a spot instance may go away, but another one will come back up and look straight away. Um, we, did a, we had a talk from uh, one of the guys at AWS for who looks after spot instances, and they have this, um, they have this tool called Spot Invaders, basically. <laughs> um, and the idea is that it's, it, the actual thing's running on a spot instance itself, but when you're playing the game, you're trying to bring down the spot instance, so you're killing the spot instances as, as you hit the, uh, the aliens in the Space Invaders game. Um, but it keeps running because uh, a new one just keeps coming back up. So it just constantly keeps uh, refreshing them. So it's actually a lot more stable than just the way it sounds, but um, it does require you to kind of engineer your application slightly differently so that if it is interrupted, you know what your, your state is and you can save that so you can resume when it comes back up again, which might be straight away, but it may be on a different instance. So you need that start and stop <coughs> ability within your application. Um, just on cross monitoring, so some of the tips we've got here are just about having daily budgeting checks. So having an alarm in your account that says, we normally spend $100 a day. If it goes over that, send an email to someone um, because that will catch things that you might not realize because you might get a bill at the end of the month, but sometimes that's too late. If, you, if you've got a runaway process that's at the start of the month, you could be thousands and thousands of a dollars in your bill and you not realize because nobody's got time to go and check the bill every single day. So having these budget and checks uh, is actually really useful. The Having a, a monitor based on expected costs, kind of similar to the daily one, but you can set up if you, once you've got your workloads on there and you know what it should cost, if it goes above that, then someone should get notified so they can actually go and have a look at it and find out well, what's costing that. And just knowing about potential spikes in costs. So like, if you set up an auto scaling group, for example, it's really important to look at how big you're allowing that auto scaling group to go. Because when you're setting up in theory, it might sound great, oh, I can just add 100 servers as a maximum. Uh, n nobody's ever going to use that, but then you get a DDoS attack in and, some, and suddenly you're 100 servers all day. Um, so it's, it's really knowing exactly where your things can go um, and what your potential spikes may be. Um, and then again, tagging uh, can actually help you break the, the cost down. So you can actually use the tagging as part of your monitoring strategy to say, um, to send out emails and go, right, okay, so this workload has a, has a learning for the cost, and then you can actually go in and break that down f via your tags. Um, and then just as I mentioned about the infra cost um, based on Terraform deployments. And just quickly, I just wanted to kind of talk about uh, DevOps. So this could be a whole talk in itself, but having everything as infrastructure as code and having a process of your deployment through from development all the way through to the end, has loads of other benefits, but from a cost point of view, it has the benefit of knowing what you've got. So if you've got everything in your, your account defined as infrastructure as code, you know exactly where it's came from, you've got the, the tags there, you can trace it back and you can have everything linked together of, right, okay, that came from this infrastructure code document, like a Terraform or a CloudFormation, um, and that just allows you to actually trace things all the way through. 
having manual things spun up all over the place is how you end up losing track of things. Uh, just having it all in infrastructure code is a really good way of knowing what your costs are uh, because it allows you to kind of track everything together. Um, and just some just hidden ones. So I've already kind of mentioned things like where everything's broken down as a, in a page you go model, but there are certain things that like people don't really think of when they're talking about cloud, like data transfer, especially out from the cloud. Um, some of the charges for data transfer out can be really um, expensive, uh, especially if you've got a NAT gateway. NAT gateways are really expensive, but there are a few ways that you can do things. So like um, if you've got infrastructure that needs to commit, uh, connect to so SD or DynamoDB or other internal AMs and services, the standard way it's set up, it'll route that traffic out via the internet and then back in to the other service, which costs you money. If you then, if you set up a private link between your VPC, so where your code is running, and that service, so SD or DynamoDB, that goes over the internal Amazon network and it's free. So we had, we had a customer who was paying $2,000 a month for their NAT gateway costs because it was going through the internet. We took out the SD and DynamoDB part of it and they went down to $100 a month, just in data transfer charges alone. Um, so it's, that one is free to set up, just link the two things together and it will allow you to save quite a lot of costs. Um, Lambda, just quickly I want to mention on, <clears throat> with Lambda you pay for the size of memory you're given answers and the execution time. And slightly counter, Indication, you can actually have uh, Lambda functions where you give it more memory and it actually ends up costing less money. Okay. Um, there's a tool out there called Lambda Power Tuning Tools which is really useful and it'll find the sweet spot of memory and execution time based on your Lambda. Um, and it's actually really useful for, you might, give, you might go up three levels of Lambda but it actually halves your costs, which doesn't really seem as if it should work, but because it's quicker at executing, you're paying less for the execution time. Um, and just SD, use things like Glacier and Frequent Access, because they, they'll, um, they'll actually help with the transfer costs. Um, and I think I'll um, basically run out of time, really. So just do this last slide quickly. Um, doing right sizing, AWS have some really good right sizing tools. So you might actually have a server that's underutilized, so you can go down a level. Um, NAT gateways, I mentioned about gateways to DynamoDB, et cetera. Elastic IPs are a common one in AWS. If you've got an unattached Elastic IP, you're gonna get charged for it. Uh, and the one that people don't really realize is if you constantly add an Elastic IP onto an instance and take it off again, once you get past 100 per month, you get charged every time it does that. So you can have automatic processes that run away and actually end up costing you 10 pence every time you do it. So I've seen that before, end up with a bill of like $70,000 for a customer because they end up doing it every minute. Um, so this can be crazy. Um, and just removing things like older snapshots you don't need anymore, using SD data to move down the tiers and everything. So um, I think that's pretty much me. There's, there's a couple of slides, just kind of a lot of the same things. So, but can run over time a wee bit, so um, have we got a few minutes for questions, or is that us? Uh, that's us. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Okay. But yeah, if anybody does have any questions, I might stand up upstairs just at the the front yeah. anyway, so people can. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. No problem. Thanks everyone.